have a meme-tacular uh, presentation for you guys, um, debunking a few um, myths about ancient history. Um, my specialty is in mostly Greece and Rome, but we're gonna dip back into Egypt. Um, if I had all night, I would be telling you um, about all kinds of myths from later history, but let's keep things a little bit more focused. So, um, you know, I'm gonna start off with this meme here. What I think like, what I think I look like when I talk about history, yes, you know, books, all that shit. Um, but in fact, I'm kind of a maniac in case you haven't figured it out um, so far. Um, this was going to be a timeline of the busted myths. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like um, my tech is uh, cooperating with me right now. But let me just say we are going to start in ancient Egypt. We're going to start with uh, the pyramids of Egypt, which were built around um, 2500 BCE. Um, and we'll end up with Cleopatra, who was born in the year 69 BCE. Nice. Um, and she died in the year 30. And in between, we're going to talk about Spartans. We're going to talk about, um, let's see, Cleopatra and who else? Oh, ah, yeah. We're going to talk about democracy in Athens. We as Americans love to look back at classical Athens and say, Ooh, they were so democratic. Turns out not, not very much democratic. And we'll also talk about the destruction of Carthage. Um, <laughs> another slide that's not cooperating. Um, but I wanted to give you a timeline of really Egyptian history. So um, what's kind of interesting about Egyptian history is, is I think it's a lot longer than people really realize. Uh, the Egyptian civilization was around for roughly 3,000 years, and uh, the crazy fact that really um, kind of blows people's minds is that with the pyramids being built in about 2500 BCE, Cleopatra died in the year 30 BCE. That means that Cleopatra is actually closer to us than she is to the pyramids. So ancient history is a lot longer than um, you might think. So the first myth I wanna deal with is the one um, about who built the pyramids of Giza. You guys are all picturing it now, these vast pyramids out in the desert, not far from uh, modern day Cairo. So the question of who built the pyramids is not a difficult one. Um, the, Difficult question is how, and that's one that people have been studying for decades, if not centuries, and no one's really been able to figure it out. If you say aliens, I will come to your home personally and kick you in the dick um, because aliens did not build pyramids. And I know some of you are like, well, duh. Um, but the interesting part of this question of where did that idea come from in terms of aliens built the pyramids? Um, it probably came around in the 1980s when a book came out called Black Athena, and it was about how a lot of Western civilization, Greece and Rome especially, drew on ancient Egypt for inspiration, and therefore a lot of what we know about Western civilization isn't European, but is in fact from Africa, from Egypt. And a lot of academics lost their fucking minds when they considered this. And so fast forward a couple of decades and people start saying, well, um, you know, Africans, people from Africa couldn't have possibly built the pyramids. No one has figured out how we built them. So we obviously must resort to the theory of aliens. And so when you say that aliens built the pyramids of Giza, you sound like a racist, you sound like an asshole. Um, because no one talks about Sto Stonehenge, sorry, I've had a little of this, whatever this is, I'm basic drinking spike seltzer um, hiccup. No one says aliens built the Roman Colosseum or no one says aliens built Stonehenge because those are things that white people made. Um, so when you're talking about um, the pyramids of Giza, um, people do tend to 
um, think too much about aliens. So um, here's the deal about Egyptian slavery. It is not really a thing. Um, the Egyptians participated in the slave trade. If they would capture prisoners of war, they might sell those prisoners to someone else, to a third party. So they would benefit from the slave trade, which not awesome, but still. But they didn't really keep slaves for themselves. They did practice something called corvée labor or coerced labor. It's kind of like, hey, you don't have anything else going on. Why don't you come help me build this pyramid over here? So um, the biggest segment of the Egyptian population were farmers, just massive amounts of farmers. Egypt was the breadbasket of the Mediterranean because they grew shitloads of wheat. But once a year, the Nile would flood and um, it meant that uh, farmers didn't have really anything to do because the Nile had flooded into their fields. So they're sitting around um, twiddling their thumbs, but then the, you know, the buddies of the um, Pharaoh say, hey, you're not doing anything. Why not come on down to Giza, help us build this pyramid. Um, if you schlep a few stones up this big old ramp, um, we'll do some good things for you. For example, that was a way to get out of paying taxes. Um, also, since the Pharaoh was a god on earth, by participating in building pyramids, that meant you were doing something to help out the gods. So it was looked on really favorably. Now, um, I don't have time to get into the whole Hebrew question. Uh, the weirdest thing about the whole kind of not a meme, but an idea of Hebrew slaves building the pyramids. The earliest reference I can find to that is not the Bible, but it is in fact the 1960s movie, um, The Ten Commandments. Um, and so I say that this is a touchy question because if you say, oh, the Hebrews weren't slaves in Egypt, you're fucking with someone's sacred book. And that's not usually a nice thing to do. Um, but I will say that the timeline of the building of the Giza pyramids and the timeline of the Hebrews presence in Egypt doesn't line up. They're off by between 700 and 1000 years. So unfortunately, um, got to burst your bubble, no aliens, no slaves, and certainly no Hebrews were building, were building the pyramids of Giza. Now, jumping ahead to the 8th century BCE or um, the 700s BCE to Sparta. So the Spartans have a um, reputation of being just a completely badass fighting force to the point that their entire culture was um, focused around training these kinds of super soldiers. And if you haven't seen this meme, or if you don't understand what this meme is about, um, the Spartans practice something called exposure. So if an infant had some kind of defect, they would expose the infant to the elements, meaning they would yeet them into um, a crevasse. Yeah, not, not cool, okay. Um, the Spartans are probably most famous to most people from the movie 300. Um, and in which the Spartans, um, a group of 300 Spartans held off this massive Persian fighting force at the Battle of Thermopylae in the Persian Wars. Um, they managed to hold off the Persians right up to the point that they didn't. Okay. So they were fairly badass as a fighting force, but exactly how badass were they? I think really the question is like how badass was the training itself? So relatively speaking, the training to be in the Spartan army was incredibly badass and every Spartan male was expected to participate. So your training began at age seven and Spartan boys were taken from their mother's homes and sent basically to military camp at age seven. And that's where they began their physical training but also a kind of psychological training where 
you were taught that to put Sparta above all else, above your love for your family or your friends or anything like that. Sparta, your city state was number one. So um, these boys would go through um, all kinds of training and they had two series of tests. One was at age 18 when they would be sent out um, into the wilderness to fend for themselves with basically nothing but like a, a cloak and a loincloth and a sharpened stick. Um, and if they survived that, then they, at age 20, they went through a lot of other uh, tests. And if you survived the test, then you got to be in the military. Um, not really part of the test, but part of the gross training was something called black broth. Um, it might be apocryphal, might not really be a thing, but the Spartans would eat this black broth that was made of pig's feet and pig's blood and also vinegar. Uh, the vinegar is not there for flavor, it's there to keep the blood from coagulating, so enjoy that. So um, why did Sparta put all this emphasis on their military training? Well, it has everything to do with the fact that the Spartans were kind of assholes and they had enslaved everyone around them um, in their vicinity of the Southern Peloponnese in Greece um, to the point that they had about 20 slaves for every Spartan citizen. And um, they were also picking fights with other Greek city-states. Uh, the city of Sparta didn't have walls around it the way other Greek city-states did. Um, they instead had their military. So how badass was this military? I'm not trying to say that the Spartan military sucked, um, these hoplites or soldiers. Um, they didn't suck, they just were no better than anywhere else. If you look at the Spartan military record, every battle, um, they're, um, military record is pretty much average if you compare them to other Greek city-states. Um, they had the same kind of weapons, um, they had the same kind of fighting formations or the phalanx that everyone else had. Um, another um, myth to bust is all of this like single one-to-one -one combat that goes on in movies like 300. The Spartans basically had no training in that. Um, if the Spartans did have a major advantage over their um, opponents. Um, one was kind of psychological because if you're in Athens and you think about Sparta, you think, oh my God, those soldiers are, are training 24 seven, 365. And we're over here inventing philosophy and building temples and shit um, while the Spartans are training. So that psychological advantage probably was really strong. Another advantage that the Spartans had was that they were really well fed because the Spartan soldiers, the Spartan hoplites, they didn't have to be farmers. They didn't have to be anything else. There was no off season. But if you're talking about Athens, most of those soldiers are farmers who are kind of scrimping um, and saving to get along. So again, the Spartan military, really badass training, but kind of middle of the road performance. I'm gonna jump over this and start talking about um, democracy in Athens. So again, like I was saying before, when we look to um, you know, our history of these values of having a republic and having democracy, we frequently look back to classical Athens, but it, um, it really was kind of a shitty democracy to live in. Um, so over the course of the seventh century, so um, the, the 600s BCE and on into the sixth century or the 500s BCE, there were kind of experiments with democracy. Um, there was a dude, Draco, who gave us our word draconian um, because he put into place really harsh laws. There was um, this dude, Solon, who tried, but then his uh, reforms were eliminated almost as soon as they went up because tyrants came in. And so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to talking about a guy called Cleisthenes. Um, Cleisthenes was like the third 
ex major, exper major experiment in Athenian democracy. And he came into Athens in the year 509, 508 BCE, and he established certain mechanisms within Athenian democracy that would have allowed more people to participate in their government, whether it's voting or running for office. So one thing he did was he established a council of 500 citizens and um, they were elected by lot. So just at random, there's no campaigning or anything like that. And the Athenians believed that being chosen at random was kind of the most egalitarian way to be chosen to participate in, um, in democracy. So this, um, this council kind of brought up big issues to vote on. So should we go to war with Persia? Should we plant more olive trees? Shit like that. Um, then in addition to the Council of 500 or the Boule, there was this assembly of citizens and um, they were allowed to do two things. First of all, they could speak at the assembly when they would get together all the citizens and say, what do you guys think about Sparta? You know, should we go to war with them? Should we not go to war with them? What? So at the assembly, all everyone um, was allowed to speak. Um, also, um, they could vote and most of them could run for office. Um, there was also an, a kind of another good thing about the um, level of democracy in Athens is that they had reasonable freedom of speech. Kind of the only thing that they couldn't do or say was they couldn't question the existence of the gods and goddesses. It was considered basically like both a sin and treason if you said the goddess Athena doesn't exist. And that's where Socrates got in trouble because he was getting the kids to kind of wonder about things like that. So as I said, if you were an Athenian citizen, you were able to um, be a part of that council of 500, which was pretty a pretty powerful place to be in Athens. You could run for office, you could vote, and you could speak in the assembly. The problem is a huge part of the Athenian population was not considered a citizen. So children, no one wants them to be voting. Um, and I say that as a teacher. Um, women were not part of Athenian democracy. Slaves, obviously, because unlike Egypt, Athens loved their slavery. Um, which again, I think that makes your democracy kind of shitty if you have slavery. Um, they can't vote. Um, medics, so this is probably a new term for you guys, is a foreigner living in Athens. So um, if you're a foreigner, you're not allowed to vote either. So you take away all those little pieces and all you get is somewhere between 10 and 20% of the population of Athens who could truly participate in politics. So that's why I give Athenian democracy in, in the fifth century kind of a C minus D plus, right? Okay, so let us now jump across the Mediterranean and go to Carthage um, for Punic at the Disco. So the Punic Wars were fought between Rome and Carthage. Carthage um, is an archeological site today. It's in modern day Tunisia. And back in the day, Carthage was a real powerhouse. And so over the course of 150 years, um, Rome and Carthage fought a series of three wars. And yes, this is the war um, where um, just a complete badass Hannibal marches elephants over the Alps to try to invade Italy, having brought them all the way from North Africa through Spain. Um, the reason why we call it the Punic Wars is that Punic is another word for uh, Carthaginian, someone from Carthage. And really, like I said, I just cannot resist a meme. So the myth that I'm gonna bust about Carthage is the fact is the myth that once Rome had definitively um, defeated the Carthaginians, 
uh, on their home turf, that they destroyed the city and then did things one better by plowing salt into the fields of Carthage um, as a means to kind of poison the fields so um, the Carthaginians would never um, be able to, uh, to grow anything. So this is complete bullshit because salt was money. Um, you're not gonna dump billions of dollars basically into the soil just to say fuck you to your enemies. In fact, the word salary comes from the Latin word for salt. Um, the Romans didn't just defeat Carthage for the fun of it, they defeated it so they could live there. So why would they be over there poisoning their own land, their own farmland? So that's real dumb, right? So again, be annoying to people at dinner parties and say, well, actually, when uh, anyone says, whoa, we're going to plow salt into the fields of Carthage, because I'm sure that comes up at a lot of dinner parties that you're at. Um, real quick to talk about Cleopatra. Um, like I said, she was born in the year 69 BCE, died in the year 30, um, lived almost her entire life in Egypt. And when you Google Cleopatra, these are kinds, uh, these are the kinds of images that show up. Everyone from Vivian Lee to Angelina Jolie, Liz Taylor, um, Heidi Klum, Beyonce. So it's kind of like, well, who is Cleopatra? And of course, we all connect Cleopatra with ancient Egypt. And you should, because Cleopatra is the last uh, Egyptian pharaoh ever. Um, after 3,000 years of having pharaohs. Um, so let me boil this down real quick. Uh, Cleopatra was not exactly Egyptian. You guys can read the shit over there on the slide. Um, the thing is that Cleopatra's entire family came from Macedonia, which was north of Greece. It's the home of Alexander the Great. So when Alexander the Great uh, conquered Egypt, and after he died, one of his buddies was put into place to govern Egypt, and his name was Ptolemy. And Ptolemy started a dynasty that began with him and ended with Cleopatra. And Ptolemy and all of his family and all of the bros that he brought with him to Egypt were all from Macedonia, okay? So we've got this invading Macedonian force governing regular regular Egyptians. And um, like you do with the dynasty, you try to keep things, I don't wanna say entirely within the family, but you try to keep things um, tight ethnically, okay? So, um, so the Macedonians were pretty intent on keeping their royal family Macedonian. That doesn't mean that there wasn't like some occasional hanky panky between some um, Macedonian leader and some Egyptian. So um, this is the weird thing about Cleopatra. Her entire family was Macedonian, but she lived almost her entire life in Egypt. So what is she, Macedonian or Egyptian? Um, the cool thing, one of the many cool things about Cleopatra is that she was probably the only member of her dynasty who could speak Egyptian. Um, everyone else was speaking Greek. Um, so she was really trying to connect with her people. And so some people speculated she learned Egyptian from her mother. Um, the portraits of Cleopatra are rare and vague enough that we can't really do any kind of study on her face to try to figure out if she um, was Egyptian or not. Um, and then you gotta ask yourself is, does it really matter? Dude, I am, I'm wrapping up right now, okay? So um, does it matter? Is she Macedonian or Egyptian? On the one hand, it doesn't matter at all because Cleopatra was a badass. Um, she managed a lot of military victories um, she survived assassination plots, um, and she did some pretty high-level negotiation with um, 
um, pretty important Roman leaders, you know, Antony and um, Julius Caesar. And she didn't only negotiate with her vagina. She did negotiate with her vagina, but not only with it. So she was, um, she was a badass. And then another thing I think is really important is like I, as a teacher, I teach a relatively diverse group of kids. And I really like to think that young girls today have um, an Egyptian as a role model, um, especially for my students, like girls of color, that they can look to Egypt and say, okay, here is a badass role model I have, I don't talk about the vagina stuff with them, don't worry. Um, here's a badass role model who came from Africa, right? So my time is up or nearly up. Um, and so just leaving you with a few um, myths that I don't have time to bust, um, if you can read them. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but um, yeah, that's it. That's it for me. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.